Mm. So, if there aren't any more questions, then we'll continue with what's actually planned for today. Oh. <clears throat> okay, so for today, the topic, the, the main topic is simply input and output on mobile devices. And this is a big topic, so it's uh, split in two parts. We'll continue with this next week in any case. Um, first of all, a few organizational things. I'll just a, a brief schedule for the next week. So um, the, we had to move the tutorial because Johannes was sick, so it's this Friday. Um, then next lecture will be on May 4th regularly. And on May 6th, the uh, second exercise sheet is due, just a reminder. I think in the sheet it says May 5th, it's actually May 6th, so my, my mistake. On the 11th and the 18th, I won't be here, but I will uh, upload a, a video lecture on YouTube so you can uh, still watch it. So I'll basically uh, probably spread it out over a few days so I won't uh, be able to record it all in one go, but... Uh, so we can still continue with the next topic then remotely, basically. So, and if there are any questions, again, please don't hesitate to use the, the forum, the message board on Moodle. Um, then on May 13th, we will have another tutorial and we will already introduce uh, basically the, the ideas for the projects because uh, after, the, after the next exercise sheets, we will do uh, small projects, I think I already mentioned that, for the rest of the semester. And since I'm at the uh, CHI conference, I'll try to bring some really recent research along, which you can then um, uh, basically work with in your projects. Um, so we'll hopefully introduce those on May uh, 13th. And on May 20th, then we'll start with the, uh, with the projects. Okay, so I'll keep this updated during the next few lectures. Um, now let's look into, into I.O. So let's first of all have a brief look again on what the issues are with mobile. Uh, mostly with touch, first of all, because that's the primary channel people are currently using. But also um, how gestures and motion play into this. Um, this, from, from now on, I'll be, be talking about a mix of commercial solutions, but also research projects. I'll usually post a link along with these. Um, so you, if you're interested, you can have a look at the papers. Most of them are actually accessible from the uh, university network. So um, just to summarize again, what are the, the big issues with uh, touch screens? Um, we don't have haptic feedback. Uh, we often have occlusion, so the hand obscures some part of the screen as opposed to a mouse cursor. Uh, we have not as much precision available, so you have a big finger rel uh, so relatively to, to a pixel size. And we also don't have a, a hover state, you so you can't basically just uh, look at things um, before you actually trigger them. And uh, First of all, I'd like to talk a bit about how touch screens actually work. So this is a brief overview, mostly related to mobile devices now. Um, the most simple one, which you still can get, is a so-called resistive touch screen. This is a, a pretty old technology, actually. So if you ever uh, have ever seen one of these old Palm pilots, they used this kind of technology. And you can actually recognize this because the, um, the surface is very, it feels very slightly soft. And the reason is that you have actually two different layers on top of each other with these very small transparent rubber dots in between which uh, insulate the two layers from each other. And when you press down with your, with your finger on the screen, then you make a contact between the two layers uh, in between those, those rubber dots. And that can then be measured electrically. Um, this has a couple disadvantages. It's not very sensitive, so you really have to push on the screen uh, that it works. It doesn't usually do multi-touch. 
um, but it also has some advantages. For example, you can use it with gloves. That's not uh, often not possible with the other types of touchscreen. I'll talk about that in a minute. And you can actually use it with any object. So you can also use uh, any pen as a, as a stylus, for example. Um, so for some special applications, this uh, is still used. Can, does anyone maybe have an idea what could be a special application where, where such a touch screen still makes sense? Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that might be where you actually have to wear gloves to protect your fingers, and if you need a, a touchscreen, then this technology actually might, might make sense. So the, the, big dis the, the big difference is that this actually needs just mechanical force, and the other touchscreens, the um, uh, capacitive ones, they need electrical contact. So you, they only work if you touch it with a bare finger. Um, by now, you can actually sometimes buy gloves which have a conductive fingertips, so you can use the um, uh, capacitive touchscreen too. But here, you usually need an electrical contact, and you have different electrodes, and they measure the, the capacitance. And from that, you can calculate the, um, um, yeah, the, the position of the finger. Um, this is also still a, a precursor to what we what we use today. This is, uh, but this can be built very robustly. So, for example, if you have a ticket vending machine at the subway station or at the train station, then they usually use some kind uh, of technology like this because you can actually build it on armored glass, so you can hit it with a hammer and it uh, doesn't do anything. So you can build it very robustly. It's not. Again, not usually multi-touch capable, but still used quite widely in, in vending machines, for example. And what mobile devices uh, currently use most of the time is called a projected capacitive touchscreen. So the idea here is that I have a grid of electrodes, transparent electrodes, um, that are not connected to each other. And uh, when I touch it with a finger, then I will change the capacitance in this row and in this row, and that can then be sensed. Um, there are two different variants. The sl slightly simpler one is called mutual capacitance, so I just measure each row and then I measure each uh, column, and then I can calculate uh, uh, finger positions from that. And the more complex variant is called self-capacitance, where I measure each, uh, each crossing point individually. Of course, this needs to happen a lot faster because you have a much, uh, much higher number of crossing points, so you need more complex circuits. Can anyone think of an idea uh, why you would actually have to use the more complex variant? So what's the, the drawback if you use just uh, measure just each row and each column? Yes? Yeah, exactly. So you get problems with multi-touch. Uh, you can still deal with two touch points, but then it would basically look like this. So for example, if you get one touch point here and one touch point there, then you get a signal on this and this uh, row and on this and this column. And then you, can, you still know there are two contacts, but you can't really tell anymore if it, is it this combination or is it, for example, this combination. Um, it still works more or less for two fingers, but if you have three, then it starts to get really confused. So uh, if you want really proper multi-touch support for more than two fingers, then you will need the, the um, self-capacitance method, which really looks at each crossing point individually. Yeah? Yes, exactly. So. No, no, there, so if you have the, the cheap, um, Basically, if you have a cheap capacitive touchscreen, even if it says multi-touch, then it might often just support at most two points. And if you have three points, then it starts to get confused. But if you have a more, uh, more expensive version, basically, or even a more expensive controller, actually, so the screen itself can stay more or less the same, just the controller has to be a little more advanced, then um, you can tell the difference between those, because then each uh, each 
uh, crossing point will create its own signal. And then you can, of course, tell these two apart. But if you have the, t the cheap uh, touchscreen variant, which only measures each, each conductor uh, across its entire length, basically, basically then you, you get this kind of ambiguity between those, those configurations. So again, for two points, it will still work because you can still like zoom or rotate up to a point. But if you want something with more contact points, then this won't work anymore. The, uh, the mutual capacitance vari variant. The self-capacitance variant no, doesn't have a problem with that. Yeah, um, I think you could explain like this. So the simple one uh, measures each each uh, row on its own. So in this example, it's one, two, three, four, five, nine measurements here, and the other one, eight measurements here. So for one for one frame, the simple method in this example does seventeen measurements, and the complex variant for this example does eight times nine measurements, so uh, not 64, uh, 72, 72 measurements. Each, so each one individually. So it, it measures first this combination, then this, and this. So it takes a lot more different measurements for each iteration, for each frame. So it has to be a lot faster, and that's why it's a little more complex. And the other one just measures one whole line at once and is basically done with it. Does that kind of answer? Okay. Other question? How big is the density um, On a, uh, well, uh, let, let me think about it. On a common device, uh, it's not as high as a resolution as the actual display. Uh, it's maybe something like 32 or 64 individual cells in one direction. Um, but it will, uh, of course, interpolate between the cells to get a more precise position. But in, in terms of pixels, basically, it's something like 32 by 64, maybe, something along those lines. OK. So this is just a brief overview over touchscreen technology. Now, um, I've already mentioned that haptic feedback is a problem, and you can't really get haptic feedback from a regular touchscreen. That's also one of the reasons why you can't type as fast. Um, and there are actually a number of projects which try to, to deal with this. Uh, I've already briefly showed this one in the, in the first lecture, I think. So this is called uh, Form. This is a, uh, by a company named Tactus. And this is basically an overlay over the iPad uh, in this case, um, which usually is flat, but which has a very thin uh, channels in that in that uh, foil, which you can basically pump in a little oil. So there's um, I don't know if this prototype has it. You can actually buy uh, this by now, and there's a big big slider, big physical slider, which you can push over, and then it will actually push a little bit of oil into those channels and they will rise up from the surface. And then you can, can basically feel, feel the keys and type a lot faster. Um, it's, a, it's a nice idea, but of course it has a number of, of drawbacks. So it's, you really have to trigger it physically. Um, it only works for one single keyboard layout. It, yeah, Good question. I haven't seen a, a, a proper study of that so far. So uh, I'm actually not sure if that company is still existing. So maybe maybe it wasn't such a big seller after all. But the um, of, the basic idea would, of course, probably work. But uh, it would work a lot better if you could do this across the whole surface, of course, because you can't even turn it to to um, to landscape mode when you when you use this because the bubbles will simply stay at the same position and the keyboard will move somewhere else. Um, or if you install a new iOS update which has a different keyboard, then this will also stop working. So it's 
probably not yet quite market ready. They have been selling it, but uh, yeah, I imagine it's not ha hasn't been such a big hit, basically. Um, Another more recent uh, research example, this um, uses so-called electrovibration. So this is a, uh, actually a much more promising approach. Um, they used a larger touch surface here, but the same principles could also apply to something like a tablet. Um, so they put a, a small electrical charge on the whole screen and um, just like when you, uh, for example, a rubber balloon against against your hair or something. You get actually uh, measurable attractive force between finger and surface. Um, and when you now change this charge according to what's on the surface, then um, you can give the user a kind of a of a feeling of of ridges and bumps on the surface, depending on what's on the screen, of course. Uh, Drawback here is that it doesn't work with multi-touch because all fingers get the same sensation at the same time. So um, if you actually want to feel like the, the, the bumps on this, this fossil, then it only works for one single finger because the, the, the force or the friction changes across the, the whole screen at the same time. So again, something that's uh, an interesting approach, but so far not something that's really uh, suitable for, for um, mass distribution in devices. You might uh, consider that for future devices it might be possible to actually do uh, different, different cells of charge across the screen and then you could maybe uh, even do multi-touch but right now this prototype is just, uh, just single touch because uh, and it also actually requires you to move your finger, because if you just keep it still, then you can't really feel a lot of difference. Yes? That also sounds like it drains a lot of battery. Um, not, not necessarily, I think. So if you just need to create a, a very small charge, yeah, like, like for example, you can get with a, with a balloon, um, then that's actually not requiring a lot of energy Maybe again, if it's running for a longer time, you couldn't tell. But I think it's maybe not such a big issue in terms of battery. But that's just a guess right now. Okay, so now let's look into a different issue. How could you, for example, deal with um, occlusion? So this is also a research project. And what these people have tried to do is to actually create some kind of geometric model of how the, the hand and arm of the user look like, in this case, uh, while holding a stylus. And so if you have this kind of occlusion model, then you, for example, could use that to, to rearrange pop-ups. So you could, uh, if you have some kind of menu or something, then you could try and avoid that it would actually pop up right under the user's hand. That would, of course, be annoying. Um, and even if you don't have such a complex model of the user's arm, then you can still use that as a rule of thumb. If you uh, pop up things to the right and uh, below the, the actual touch point, then they might have a bigger chance of getting overlooked. So that's a very rough rule of thumb, but it's most mobile uh, operating systems by now try to, to keep that in mind. So for example, if you long press on some text in Android, then the menu will simply pop up above where there's not much chance that you would, you'd actually overlook it. Um, well, a completely different approach to dealing with um, occlusion is this nano touch. This simply moves the touch surface to the back of the device and let's basically gives you the illusion that the device is actually transparent and that you can touch things from, uh, from behind. And um, yeah, so there's basically just a, a second touch surface on the, on the backside. Um, does anyone have an idea how would, did they maybe create that illusion of having a transparent device? Yeah? No, it's actually far simpler. Don't even need a because if you have had a camera, then it would have to it would be like uh, have to be a fish eye camera. It's much simpler, yeah. 
Uh, it's just an image of a finger. That's all it is. <laughs> and usually that's enough for people to kind of get the feeling that it's actually their own finger because it moves along with their finger. Um, you can do that to, to use that to do really small screens. Um, again, it's a, it's a research prototype. It's not something I've really seen in reality so far. But from uh, time to time, I've seen um, smartphones, which you can actually buy, with have, which have a second display on the back, for example, a paper display, e-paper display, which saves a lot of energy and which is also usually touch sensitive. So you could actually use that to implement such a device. Yeah. Of course, yeah. No, it's actually just a touchpad like on a laptop on the on the back side. So it's it's opaque on the back side. It's not another display. Um, for at least for this prototype, uh, if you think about those uh, phones with a second uh, paper display on the back side, then you would of course need to turn that off basically as long as you're doing that kind of interaction because then people would actually be able to, to sort of see what you're doing. Um, yeah, again, it's a, it's a research prototype and they were talking about that it might be possible to use it with very small screens. Of course, uh, the, the small screens which are starting to, to be popular now are smartwatches and there this doesn't really work because I can't touch my smartwatch from the other side. Yes, please. No, it's just a touchpad, like on oh, the laptop. Okay, so it just exactly. Uh, yes. I. Yes, that's a good. Yes, exactly. So I think uh, the solution here was, so if you touch it lightly, then you just get this, uh, this cursor basically with the, with the finger image moving around. And if you push it stronger, then it will actually trigger something. So you can basically just move the cursor around uh, if you touch it lightly and then you push and then it will, will trigger something. Any additional questions?